Great to meet you all. My name is Vincent, as John mentioned. I actually started working on Snorkel when it was a research project at the Sanford AI Lab when we were actually building a lot of the foundations of the ideas you'll hear today around data slicing and how to actually sample meaningful subsets of your data for evaluation purposes. I ended up leading our machine learning team and over the last few years have led AI initiatives on our product team. So super excited to be here and uh, sharing some of the latest with you all. Rebecca? Hello, good morning, everybody. I'm also very excited to be here. Um, I have been working here at Snorkel for a couple of years now, um, and I'm a full stack senior software engineer. I focus mostly on workflows, so making it easy for customers to view their data and evaluate their models um, using our product, Snorkelflow. Let me start with a little bit of an agenda for what we'll run through today. I'll start by motivating why is LLM evaluation hard? Um, why do we need it? I'll talk through a few common approaches that we've seen out there that are that are effective for different types of use cases and have trade-offs for others. And then I'll dive a little deeper into Snorkel's approach, which uh, takes a number of these hybrid workflows and and you know makes it the best of uh, many of these worlds. Rebecca will then run a demo to actually make a lot of the concepts I'll run through a little bit more real with our product Snorkel Flow, and I'll close this out with a few takeaways and. Uh, a spoiler kind of new new offer that we're we're uh, releasing as a part of our recent evaluation push. So without further ado, I will jump into uh, some of the high level motivation here. So why do we need LLM evaluation? Why is it why is it important? The headliner here is that eval is the gateway to production. It determines whether your models are actually ready or not for production. Hey, is this? Um, LLM actually providing complete, accurate, and helpful responses? Is it leading to downstream positive user experiences? And critically, is it adhering to company policies, ethical standards, brand guidelines, certain you know com compliance standards? The notion of LLM eval is actually quite nuanced um, in this Gen AI world. And so having a very clear understanding of what good looks like ends up being a critical step to shipping with confidence. Second, you know, having an eval is a great way to understand, hey, as I'm making updates to my LLM, is it performing better? Are there regressions? Think of it as a unit test as a, in a way for whether you're, you're confidently shipping changes to your actual LLM pipeline. And critically, ideally, evals are giving you a sense of where the model's falling down and needs improvement. It can be that compass to help you understand, hey, where do I need to actually improve in order to make sure that this model is actually ready for production. And so when you think about eval in the LLM world, the definition of what good looks like is actually way more nuanced than accuracy on its own. There are different axes from toxicity, hey, is this actually a harmful or inappropriate response, um, not just you know correct, uh, is this uh, explainable, right? Can the LLM substantiate or cite its right sources when it's actually providing a response? Um, and is it compliant? You know, is this LLM's response in line with company standards, brand guidelines? Is it is it representing our company in a way that is actually acceptable? You know, from a from a public lens. Now, the key idea here is that evals should be use case specific, right? They should be enterprise specific. Companies should be taking their own definitions, their own specs for what good looks like, and encoding it into their evaluations and. You know, the sets of acceptance criteria could expand way beyond kind of what standard benchmarks or OSS evals offer. And so that's going to be a big focus for this webinar today is how do you actually build and customize these use case specific, enterprise specific evals so that they work for your own use case? And in a Gen AI world, right, this process, as I alluded to earlier, is more critical than ever, right? There's this notion that the long tail is often the most critical in these Gen AI use cases. You can imagine, hey, let's let's assume we're building some sort of e-commerce chatbot. There are certain queries that users might have about shipping issues, around credit card transactions, where hey, now they're actually churn risks. Now they're actually, you know, talking about the user experience in a way that is really, really critical to get right. That long tail is often where you want to pay attention to make sure that your LLM is actually operating. Um, in a in a positive way at scale. Two, as I alluded to earlier, the definition of correctness is actually quite nuanced, right? A response can be technically accurate, but be rude, be non-compliant. It could be technically accurate, but it could be missing critical information or context. That 
definition of correctness is often subjective as well when you're asking annotators to label this. And so being able to handle that nuance, that subjectivity ends up being um, an, an added challenge in this Gen AI first world. Third, these LLMs are being asked to do dozens, hundreds, sometimes thousands of infinite, you know, fine-grained tasks. You can think about, you know, traditional machine learning models. They had a very concrete output schema. Hey, is this document, is this email spam or normal? Hey, what is the, you know, uh, a set of entities that re relate to kind of companies in this document? In the LLM world, a chatbot could be asked to do one or, you know, hundreds of these individual tasks um, and possibly even take actions. And so the action space, the output space of these LLMs are much broader. And as a result, the evals that we build for them actually need to be far more fine-grained as well. Leading with the punchline here, right, the spoiler alert is that enterprises are really blocked on effective LLM evaluation for a number of reasons. One, current approaches, which I'll go into in just a second, are often pretty generic, right? They're not built for your specific enterprise data and objectives. And as a result, you know, aren't as effective, right? They're usually evaluating more, more global, you know, generic objectives, which are quite helpful when you're building these base foundation models, but again, can be less relevant when you're trying to ship your own models to production. Two, these metrics and benchmarks are often pretty coarse grained, right? They don't actually indicate where in the data your model's falling down. They don't indicate what business critical subsets you should pay attention to in order for your LLM to ship confidently to production. That coarse grained nature means that your insights are less useful, your, your evals are less actionable, and often ends up being a blocker to shipping with confidence. Third, a lot of the eval approaches today are really hard to scale, right? They're either blocked by expensive subject matter experts, right? The doctors, underwriters, financial analysts, right? Folks who actually have the information in their head about what good looks like. They're spending time in Excel, you know, really manually going through these approaches in a way that isn't scalable. And I'll speak to some other approaches as well, where, hey, you might be using another LLM to um, evaluate your, your model. Sometimes these approaches see really high costs, right, in terms of per token um, cost, especially if you're running this through CI on a per commit or, you know, a, a weekly basis, for example. So with that context in mind, let me jump through a few common approaches and some of their trade-offs. At a high level, we'll talk through three different approaches for LLM eval today as we as we um, see them with our customers and our and our users. And we'll talk about some of the trade-offs and um, where they're helpful and where they sometimes fall down. We'll run through OSS benchmarks and metrics. This is the notion that there's some really exciting open benchmarks out there, many of which we're actually contributors of at uh, on the snorkel side. They're very critical to moving the field forward, um, but often are missing some enterprise-specific context. We'll talk about a very common and exciting approach called LLM as a judge, where you use one LLM in a really fast and scalable way, but often, again, is kind of missing your specific domain knowledge and task-specific nuance. And third, we'll, we'll understand how human annotation is often a great way to leverage your own domain knowledge, but as you can imagine, is very resource intensive and uh, can lead to certain biases if you're not careful about how you're setting up those types of evals. So OSS benchmarks and metrics, right? The field is is uh, built on these types of open benchmarks, right? Uh, we're big fans of Helm over at Stanford. We we help contribute to this over in 2022 in an ongoing way um, with our co-founder Chris Ray, and a lot of these benchmarks, right, are are really really exciting ways to measure generic general purpose LLMs, um, compare them to each other, and have been really good ways to understand, hey, are we moving forward with each iteration of these large language models at scale? So these are really good for comparing these general purpose LLMs, these you know larger foundation models. But oftentimes when we talk to our customers and users, they don't quite apply to specialized use cases, right? These general metrics around say reasoning or NLP or you know um, sentence completion or instruction following are again helpful when you're building these base models, but can be a little bit less relevant when you're trying to build a you know medical copilot, right? Or a or, you know financial services chatbot. Um, they don't often operate over proprietary domain specific data, right? They're often built around generalist data sets. And so as a result, can often fall down when you're trying to make them work for your own specific use cases. Another approach that we've seen as a really common and, and actually quite clever approach is to use an LLM as a judge. The idea here is, hey, use one LLM as your evaluator model. You know, this could be an off-the-shelf GPT. There have been some approaches where 
you know, uh, folks have been fine tuning their own eval focus LLMs to rate or compare responses. But the challenge here is that while they're really good for quick and dirty sanity checks of, you know, general purpose LLMs, they can be a pretty good way to get, give you a gut check, you know, in a pretty scalable way by just running your LLM, you know, programmatically, they, they can also be very effective for evaluating distilled models, right? So if your main goal is to take some generalist LLM and put it, uh, distill it down into a more cost-effective form factor, it can be a very, very effective way to actually, you know, use that as a ground truth set. The challenge is that for high accuracy, specialized use cases, again, for cost-effective evaluation where you're sensitive to these high per token costs, these, these methods can, can fall down. And I'll share an analogy for how I think about this, right? Imagine you're a hospital. Imagine you've helped train a bunch of college students all the way from undergrad through residency and fellowship. And now you're asking, you know, another college student off the street to evaluate that, you know, doctor who you've trained up over the years. That's often not a sensical way to actually, you know, capture your own objectives and domain specific knowledge, you know, that's specific to your hospital, specific to your specialty, maybe can give a gut check for different types of problems. But if you're really building these enterprise specific applications, this is where we see some of these approaches fall down in, in specialized use cases. Human annotation is another approach here, right? The idea is to take human annotators, either outsourced or in-house, and use them to manually rate or compare LLM responses. And, you know, if you're outsourcing, this can be a really, you know, nice and scalable way for domain general problems, but it can really be a non-starter if you're trying to evaluate, you know, proprietary domain-specific data, right? We often work with enterprise customers in finance, healthcare, you know, even tech where, Data privacy is a huge, huge concern, and even sending a lot of these, you know, data points in, in an outsourced way is is often a non-starter. These folks don't really have the expertise to label against specific objectives, and in a lot of cases, it's it's just not uh, compliant to send this data off-prem. Another approach is teams may actually leverage their subject matter experts to annotate in-house data, right? And this is great for specialized use cases. It's great to um, you know, try to take a look at these proprietary domain specific data sets. But again, it can be really unscalable. These are, you know, doctors, underwriters, analysts that we're talking about who have day jobs, and we're asking them to spend many, many hours, often hundreds or thousands of hours in Excel, looking at these data points one by one, it can be a really cost ineffective approach that that doesn't quite scale, especially if your objectives are changing a bunch over time, you can imagine, hey, every time you get new data, every time you change your business goals, you kind of have to start from scratch in order to evaluate these models um, in a robust way over time. So on their own, a lot of these approaches are, are insufficient for enterprise use cases. A lot of our focus at Snorkel has been thinking about how do we take these approaches and um, you know, take the best of all of these worlds to, to build these domain-specific custom evals that work for you know, enterprise use cases. So that's really what we're going to be talking about with our own approach here is to say, LM evaluation, what can we do if we power these evals using a lot of our, you know, bread and butter programmatic data development approaches, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail here. So high level idea is, you know, we often recommend to our users and customers to build LLM evals with confidence. You need to be building custom fine grain evals over your specific data and your specific expertise. The benefit here is threefold. One, they're specialized, right? So they're purpose built with, with your own spec, right? To outsource your spec is to outsource your special sauce and your um, differentiation. And so keeping that in-house knowledge of what good looks like is, is uh, and encoding that into your evals is a really critical piece here. Two, these evals have to be fine grained, right? We have to go beyond these coarse grain high level metrics and really help our users understand what does performance look like over business critical data slices, which I'll go into a little bit more detail, but the TLDR is these slices represent subsets of data that are meaningful to you. They could be different tasks. They could be different languages that you care about, different product lines or topics you want to monitor performance over. Again, these are all specific to enterprises. And so encoding that knowledge of what matters to you ends up being a really critical component of getting that fine grained understanding of how this LLM is performing. And three, we should be building these evals in a much more scalable way, right? Instead of operating in Excel or in ad hoc, you know, ways, the emailing documents back and forth, how do we capture this in a programmatic workflow where we're building code artifacts that are scalable, that can be audited, just like, you know, software is, 
that can be adapted and refactored just like software is? How do you build much more scalable artifacts that will scale with your changing business needs and changing data distributions? So on the specialized front, you know, one way to think about this from a mental model perspective is the more complex and bespoke your data is, right? Hey, the more, you know, healthcare specific or hospital specific your data is, the more you'll need this specialized custom eval. The higher your model accuracy as well, the more you'll need these custom evals, right? You can imagine we, we work with some financial services customers who really can't afford certain hallucinations, um, especially when they're powering co-pilots for their analysts, especially when they're powering customer facing workflows, right? Where a mistake about someone's balance or transaction information can often be a major, major security and compliance risk. And so this is an oversimplified view to think about when this specialized, you know, purpose-built eval is important. And in a lot of enterprise use cases, we find that some amount of customization is very, very high leverage for these teams. Two, it's really important to measure this fine-grained performance, right? And the key abstraction, as I alluded to earlier, is the notion of a data slice, right? These models are being asked to perform a number of different tasks at the end of the day and being able to track, hey, what is the performance when I'm, you know, when our users are filing a dispute versus checking a balance versus reporting theft or fraud can be a very, very important way to understand business critical performance. With coarse grain metrics, you might get a high level accuracy metric or a high level blue score or rouge score, but it's not really telling you, hey, what are my business critical functions that I need to really shore up before I actually feel comfortable shipping this to production? So again, the key abstraction here is slice and dice your data with data slices and use that to define different meaningful tasks, languages, topics, really whatever is meaningful to your business to actually evaluate um, in production use cases. The last pillar here is all about building scalable evals, right? And this is where a lot of the technology that we've built way back from our early days as a research project at Stanford come into play, right? A lot of the key idea here is you want to take your domain knowledge and expertise, right? We want to have your subject matter experts and data scientists sitting next to each other instead of in silos. Again, these are collaborations with doctors, with underwriters, with analysts, with folks who actually have the knowledge for what it looks like. And we want to encode that into programmatic code artifacts. So one piece of intuition here is, hey, you know, if we have an, a specific catalog, you know, of, of products, let's map that to different slices, right? That's a piece of domain knowledge that we should encode into our software system. Hey, if, you know, points in this cluster are related to, you know, friendly or positive responses, yeah, let's label that as an acceptable response. These are all heuristics or, or a kind of pro programmatic artifacts that we can use to scale out subject matter expertise, which Rebecca will go into a little bit more detail when she shows this in the live demo. Okay, so we've talked about each one of these three axes. How does this actually look in practice? What does the workflow look like to build these custom evals in a scalable and efficient way? So we have a four-step workflow here that Rebecca, again, will go into in a little bit more detail, but I'll help set the stage here and frame what this looks like in practice, right? And the key idea is that we're trying to take the best of all of those approaches that we mentioned earlier with a hybrid programmatic and manual approach to really give your teams the highest leverage when it comes to building purpose-built use case specific evals for your enterprise problems. So the first step here is to build a golden data set with your own expertise. The idea is that, hey, these experts in your organizations, oh, you want to use their time really effectively. So rather than having them label tens of thousands, you know, possibly millions of data points, let's have them focus on a subset, you know, and, and start to write down the rationale for what good looks like in a pretty meaningful way. So let's create that golden data set with your limited budget. And step two is all about encoding and scaling that acceptance criteria into what we call a quality model. The goal of this quality model is to really imitate the preferences and rationale of these experts. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about how we do that from a technical perspective. But this is really a much more scalable way to model your experts using a purpose-built you know, scalable artifact here. Step three is to really write down, hey, what are the what are the prompts that matter to you, right? What are the slices that we want to really encode in order to understand how, you know, for example, shipping shipping issues compare to general product Q&A questions in your user queries? What are those slices and how do we encode them in a meaningful way? And step four is all about taking all these pieces, pulling them together into a fine-grained benchmark so that you can actually understand what what is good look like? Where is my model falling down? And what are my next steps for actually improving performance? 
So let me run through each one of these steps quickly before tossing it over to Rebecca for a deeper dive work, uh, workflow walkthrough. Step one is all about, you know, taking your gold, uh, your, your experts and, and helping them derive a golden data set. So the key idea here is quite simple. You can imagine, hey, using your experts, let's actually try to write down what sorts of responses are acceptable versus ones that we should reject. As they're doing this, you can imagine they're actually running through a bunch of rationale in the back of their heads, right? They're saying, okay, great. This was pretty concise. This response, it was friendly. You know, it says the right information. I'm going to, I'm going to accept this. In these cases, they might realize, hey, this is not really answering our users' questions. We should be pulling from the website, giving a link, and actually providing the answer instead of referring them to their website. That's not that's not a great response. Let's actually reject this. These pieces of rationale, you know, are are pieces that we want to encode in our quality model. So, the key idea here is all of these pieces of acceptance criteria we want to programmatically encode into a custom quality model. The intuition for how SMEs are actually judging responses. We can write it down, right? We can capture that into our acceptance criteria. So in this case, we could say, hey, if responses, I don't know, or contains personal information that's definitely not compliant, if it's way too verbose, yeah, I don't, I don't like that response. Let's reject it. In other cases, we might say, if a response is well structured, right? Hey, maybe this is a co-pilot use case where we need a quickly skimmable and glanceable, you know, response so that an agent, a human in the loop agent, can actually leverage this more effectively. Yeah, that's that's a great response. Let's actually accept that if you know it has a positive tone, you know, and represents our you know friendly brand guidelines. Hey, let's accept that as well. Again, these are simplified examples, but the key idea is how would your SMEs actually judge responses when they were going through that manual exercise, and how do we scale this process up programmatically to encode that criteria into a custom quality model? So again, what does this look like in practice? Now, not only do we have manual ground truth, we also have programmatic artifacts that represent our SME's preferences. Hey, if the response redirects to a website, that's not great. We got to reject that. Or if a response is pretty friendly, great. You know, let's accept that response. And taking a number of these heuristics, we can actually start to build a quality model at scale. So I'll glaze over some of the details here. But again, a lot of our bread and butter workflow at Snorkel is all about taking expertise and coding that into these programmatic artifacts denoising them and combining them so that you have high quality data for the purpose of evaluation. So this is a virtuous cycle, right? It's an iterative cycle where you continuously take SME knowledge and ultimately continue to up-level and, and, and encode that knowledge into artifacts so that you get much more scalable data sets in a quality model at the end of the day. The third step of the workflow here, once you have that quality model, is to actually slice and dice your prompts. Right. The goal here is to encode your, you know, semantically meaningful tasks, topics, and languages that you in particular care about for your business um, and make sure that you're monitoring performance over those specific slices. So in this case, one slice might correspond to basic business facts. Hey, when is, when is the store open? You know, do you have international shipping? These are basic kind of Q&As about uh, maybe an e-commerce business overall. And you can group in one way to say, hey, this is maybe a slice that um, we get a lot of questions about this very high volume. It sits in that head or torso distribution, but is, is important for us to get right so that users are coming to our store at the right hours. On the other hand, there might be a slice of requests that we're getting related to shipping issues, for example. This may be a little bit rarer than business facts, but are really important for us to get right because, hey, if you know someone's package arrived, but you know, or, or if tracking says it arrived, but it didn't actually, or someone wants to return an item and, you know, they're, they're having issues. Um, these are possible turn risks, right, for our users or may actually affect the overall customer experience. So while, you know, these slices represent different subsets or, you know, different proportions of the data set, it may often be the same case that a rarer, you know, infrequent slice could be really meaningful to the business to get right. So bringing all these pieces together, we can actually now produce an eval report that gives us that fine-grained report, right? So unpacking this a little bit, the rows of our report correspond to different data slices. Hey, business Q&A versus shipping issues. We now have a much more fine-grained view in addition to overall quality view of what this looks like. And the columns here correspond to different metrics, right? We can evaluate against our manual ground truth. We can evaluate against, against our quality mod model, which was much more programmatic, and any other sorts of metrics that we might want to encode into our benchmark. Now we have a really fine-grained kind of detailed view to help us understand where our model is falling down and what to do next. So 
you might realize, oh shoot, you know, shipping issues are actually a major uh, important, you know, customer success metric that we want to improve. Um, let's dig a little deeper and let's try to, you know, improve quality here, for example. Once you actually improve quality, you might want to do some sort of pairwise comparison. Hey, maybe I started with a Llama 70B model. I fine tuned it, you know, using some great uh, uh, data development techniques to curate data. And okay, great. You know, I'm starting to improve performance over that slice in a meaningful way, right? Using these types of fine grained benchmarks as a way to effectively unit test your data and your LLMs and avoid regressions is a very practical way that we found teams can start building confidence over their specific custom you know, uh, use cases and evaluations. So let me zoom out for a second, right? What did I just show? I showed how you can take expertise and use their time more effectively to create that golden data set. We talked about how to encode that expert acceptance criteria into a custom quality model using a lot of these programmatic data development techniques. We talked about how to slice and dice the different prompts of your, you know, query space so that users actually get a sense of, hey, what matters to me and what do we want to track? And we talked about how to pull all these pieces together so that you have now a fine-grained benchmark that you can action on and understand quality with um, to, again, ship your LLMs with confidence. So what I'll do now is actually toss it over to Rebecca, you know, our, our software engineer who's been leading a lot of these efforts on the on the R&D side, who will walk through what this workflow looks like with our platform, Snorkel Flow. So Rebecca, we'll toss it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Vincent. Okay. So before diving into the demo itself, um, I want to walk through an overview of this workflow. Here is our overall workflow. We'll start here with our model. So this model uh, is fed questions and gives responses. And these question response pairs make up your data set. And this is your model that you hope to eventually be able to deploy into production. If this is the first time you're working on building this model, you might start with an off-the-shelf model, such as GPT-4 or Mistral. You can also start with an OSS benchmark. As we go through the data development workflow, you will fine-tune this model to improve its performance until you're satisfied and ready to deploy. So for clarity throughout the rest of this demo, I will call this model the fine-tuned model. And the question we want to answer today is, how do I know how well my model is performing? The common approaches to evaluation right now are using an OSS benchmark, manual annotation, and using another LLM as a judge for your LLM. Snorkel effectively draws on the strengths of all three of these approaches, which you'll see throughout this overview. So the first step to understand how your model is performing is to create a golden data set. And this is done through manual annotation. To scale this up for evaluation, you then programmatically encode your labeling preferences into functions using Snorkel Flow. So you can start by using another LLM. Here we see GPT-4 as a judge for your LLM. You can then add additional signal about your preferences. So for example, here, we don't want our model to mention any of our competitors. Having these labeling functions allows you to scale up your annotation reliably, efficiently, and traceably. You can then use these sources of signal, both manual and programmatic, to train a quality model. And this quality model learns your preferences. So given any data point, it can output a label and confidence in that label. This allows your labeling to scale beyond your current data to any future data you might want to use as well. Once you have some labeled data, you look at your question response pairs and segment the data by question categories you care about. This creates those slices that you care about. So here we have a slice that contains all the administrative data or all the data in Spanish, et cetera. This will give you a more fine-grained understanding of where your model is performing well. Finally, you can calculate metrics to see how your model is performing and snorkel flow uh, allows you to see your metrics across all of these slices. And this provides a fine-grained and actionable evaluation report. Snorkel supports many different metrics. Uh, here we see acceptance rate, and it also allows you to define your own custom metrics. From here, you can dive into the data, focus on specific slices, do further data development on these slices, and curate new data sets for fine-tuning. And then you start the whole loop over again. So. Now that we understand the, this overall evaluation workflow, 
let's dive into the demo. For our demo today, we are going to be working at Acme Credit Services, and we are building a co-pilot called Jarvis. This here is Jarvis. Jarvis is designed to answer financial service questions to help our customer service agents. So when a customer poses a question, Jarvis will then generate a factual, grounded, helpful response. So we'll start by being here in our pre-production environment, and we've been noticing some odd behavior from this current version of Jarvis. So I will show us some examples. Um, we can ask a question like, how is my credit score calculated? Since this is a pretty generic question, we can expect a relatively good response out of the box. And sure enough, you can see here that Jarvis is giving correct percentages for the calculation of FICO scores. So that's great. I'll now ask something a bit more specific to Acme. Um, I have some weird clothing charges on my credit report. How can I dispute? As we look at this response, we start to see some problems. First of all, our fine-tuned model Jarvis is talking about stock purchases. I asked about clothing purchases, so this is a hallucination. We can also see a recommendation to contact the SEC and file a police report. As someone who's worked with Acme in customer service, I know that this isn't what you want to be doing. There's a very prescribed set of steps you would do inside of Acme's website to actually solve this problem. So. We know our chatbot has some weaknesses and now we need to figure out how to evaluate and fix those weaknesses. So we gathered a representative data set of question response pairs from Jarvis. And now we're going to hop into Snorkel Flow to manually annotate some of this data. Here we're in Snorkel Flow's annotation suite. The subject matter expert can read the prompt and the prompt prefix can read through this response and also look at any of the context that the model retrieved to help it answer the, answer the question. Then after looking at all of these pieces, the subject matter expert can indicate if this response is correct, polite, well-structured and accept it, or if not, and reject it. For this use case, I've, I've created a simple accept reject label schema, but this is also fully customizable. So you can pick whatever labels you want, have free text labels. Let's go through and annotate a couple of these data points. This, this response about raising my credit score looks pretty good. If I go to my next one, this response also looks good. My goodness, it is quite long. Okay, personally, I don't wanna read this whole response and I can imagine that our customers wouldn't either. So I'm actually gonna tag this response as a little bit too verbose, but it does have pretty good content. I'll now go to the next data point. Okay, and this response, I'm noticing that it's a huge wall of text. And I actually kind of liked that this response seg segmented it into bullet points that helped me skim it a lot faster. Whereas this one is harder to read. So I'm just gonna leave a comment here. I would prefer a structured list, right? So I'm acting here as a subject matter expert going through and annotating these documents. And you can see that not only am I checking for correctness, but I'm also making sure that these responses align with Acme's preferences for how they want their chatbot to respond. You can imagine that these preferences could vary company to company. Some companies might prefer a formal academic tone. Others might want a casual light tone. Something that we feel very strongly about at Snorkel is that to build a successful, to build successful machine learning initiatives in the enterprise, generative or predictive, you need a single platform where the domain experts and the data scientists can collaborate. And this is because the input from those domain experts is critical to tuning these systems right. So you can imagine that I keep annotating and this gets tedious pretty quickly. For Acme, this approach is problematic because it's slow, expensive, and not scalable. So we can pretend now that I've annotated about 10% of my test data to create this um, ground truth golden data set. Next, I want to encode this subject matter expertise into labeling functions so that we can evaluate the other 90%. You can think of labeling functions as the rationale behind why you want to accept a response or reject it. So I'll hop into our studio page of Snorkel to encode some of that. 
And we'll start actually by using LLM as a judge to create a baseline for us. So here um, I wrote this uh, labeling function to get us started and I'll show you how I did that. In Snorkel Flow, we have this prompt zone. It allows you to prompt an LLM. So here we are prompting GPT-4, but we're integrated with all the major model providers and you can also add your own custom integrations there. And we're starting with a basic prompt. If the response answers the question, then label accept. And we're looking at, at how it's doing across uh, several of these data points. You can see um, that Snorkel Flow has very easy native support for this approach. However, using LM as a judge has some drawbacks. It's often noisy and prone to similar, similar error modes as your own fine-tuned model. You can see here that the precision is not great. So Snorkel effectively addresses these drawbacks by using this LLM as a labeling function instead of just on its own. So instead of relying on this LLM as the entire evaluation report approach, we can use it as another signal in addition to all of the signals that our subject matter experts are giving us. So we'll continue to gather some of that signal. For example, something I noticed while, evaluate, while looking through this uh, data set is that the our fine-tuned model sometimes seems to truncate the response. So I'm gonna write another labeling function. And you can see we have lots of different templates uh, that you can do here. I'm going to say that we don't want our LLM to truncate our responses. So if it's super short, we want to reject it. Um, and I can name this so that I can understand what it is going back. So I'll say reject truncated responses. And now we can look at this. And you'll see, okay, this is exactly what I had noticed. Sometimes this makes no sense. This is an apparent error mode of our current uh, fine-tuned Jar Jarvis model. So we don't want our model to be doing this. And so I'll add this labeling function as a source of signal. We also want to ensure that our responses adhere to corporate guidelines and policies. So we talked about when we were annotating that we prefer structured responses to huge walls of text. So Let's write a regex labeling function. And here I'll say if it matches the pattern of a list, then we'll accept it. And here I can name it accept structured lists. And let's see how that does. Okay, awesome. So you see here that it's pulling out any response that has a structured list. And it's saying, this is great. This is some signal that we want. Um, so I'll create this labeling function as well. So you can see now, Instead of having to manually label all of those data points, Snorkel Flow has labeled them for me. Once a user has written several labeling functions here, um, these functions are combined uh, to create programmatic labels for the entire data set. These programmatic labels are then used to train a simple model that we call a quality model. And let's train one here. So you see you can pick uh, a model architecture. We'll just go with logistic regression to keep it simple. I can name it my quality model and I can select what fields I want it to train over. This quality model, simply put, is a model that looks at a data point. So in this case, an instruction context response triple and then returns a label with some degree of confidence. So in this use case, the quality model will look at a data point and say, okay, I'm 83% sure we should accept this data point, or I'm 90% sure we should reject this data point. We then use this quality model to evaluate our fine-tuned model. One of the things um, that's unique with generative use cases is that the manual labels collected by domain experts are effectively thrown out with each iteration of fine-tuning. And this is because when you fine-tune your model, it generates new and hopefully better responses to the same questions. So now you have an entirely new data set and the old labels no longer apply. So if you relied on manual annotation, you'd have to restart the annotation process with each fine tuning iteration. To avoid this, we rely on the quality model because it can give us labels without requiring new manual annotations. Whenever we, re we receive updated data from a new fine tuning iteration, we can simply apply the labeling functions to the new data and train the quality model on the newly created programmatic labels. This allows us to generalize our labeling preferences to new data without requiring any new manual annotation. This is a technique that the leading model providers are using and talking about in their research. 
Not only has Snorkel been doing this for years, but Snorkel Flow enables you to have complete control over training and adjusting your own quality model. And that is, this quality model is integrated seamlessly into your generative AI workflow. So now that we have our quality model, let's take a look at our evaluation reports. And you can navigate by going to evaluate. So here is our evaluation report. And we have two numbers here. We're using the metric acceptance rate, um, and that is the percentage of responses generated by your fine-tuned model that are deemed good or acceptable. So we have an acceptance rate based on the manually annotated ground truth, and then we have one determined by the quality model. So this one is taking into account many sources of labeling signal, and this is only taking into account our manual annotations. And these two numbers are helpful to evaluate helpful to me to evaluate how my fine-tuned model uh, is doing overall, right? We're, we're somewhere between a, a 55 and 60% um, acceptance rate for this, this Jarvis V1. But I'm still left a little bit in the dark about where my chatbot Jarvis is responding well and where Jarvis might be struggling. To actually build robust generative AI in the enterprise, we need to not only ensure that our solution is globally highly accurate, but it's also highly accurate across important data slices. As Vincent explained earlier, data slices are an important piece of the evaluation suite within our product. They help us identify the distribution of our data so we can ensure we're generating high quality outputs from many different categories within our data set. These slices can be thought of as subsets of our data that we care about and model performance on. Often slices are tied to business objectives or specific divisions or departments within the company. So I will walk through creating these slices and then how to create custom fine-grained evaluation reports using these slices. So let's jump over into our integrated Jupyter Notebook to walk through slice cre creation. And all the tools we saw for writing labeling functions are also available for writing slicing functions. So prompts, embeddings, heuristics, like dictionaries, keywords, regular expressions. Typically, these slices are written over the prompt inputs, so in this case, over the questions field. As our first example here, let's dive into the Spanish slice. Acme is thinking about expanding to Latin America, so we want to track our performance on responses in Spanish. And I wrote a function here um, that if this fast text model um, predicts, predicts that the language of the question response pair is Spanish, then we want to put that data point in the Spanish slice. Let's also walk through, we can walk through identity theft. So the creation of this slice is motivated, motivated by some of our competitors receiving negative publicity about how their chatbots handled customers dealing with identity theft. So Acme's CEO recently asked us how Jarvis performs when asked questions about identity theft. In order to answer this question, our data science team decided to create a slice of all of the data points relating to identity theft. Now that we've defined um, some of these data slices, we can create a new evaluation report to get a more fine-grained look um, at how our fine-tuned model, Jarvis, is performing across uh, these, these different slices that we care about. Okay, so looking at this new evaluation report, there are a couple of things that are jumping out to me immediately. First of all, I'm seeing that we don't have any Spanish data in our evaluation data set. And this makes sense. Historically, all of Acme's customers have spoken English. So now we know we should probably ask Jarvis some questions in Spanish and get some responses to add to the data set. Once we do that, we can get some baseline metrics here for how Jarvis is performing um, in Spanish. The second thing I really wanna pay attention to here is this identity theft slice. And you can see that even though we have a 50, 60% acceptance rate overall, we're doing terribly on identity theft questions. Now we know maybe why our, our customers, um, our competitors have ha been having trouble um, with these questions. It looks like they don't work out of the box. So I've identified a slice that's performing poorly. And now there are several things I could do. I could go ask domain experts to write some gold standard responses for how to respond when a customer asks about identity theft. I could upsample the representation of this slice in the curated data set for the next iteration of fine tuning. I could go back into Snorkelflow Studio and look at 
all of the data points that are in this slice and see if clicking through those data points, I can see some common mistakes and write labeling functions to help train our model to avoid those common mistakes. So we hosted a webinar recently that went through this, this fine tuning piece in detail. So for the sake of time, we'll just say that we looked at the data, we corrected some error modes, and then we went through this fine tuning iteration. Once we have um, the new data from the new fine tuned model, we can then view the new evaluation report in our evaluation page. You can go check out the other webinar for those details. And I went ahead and did this for us in advance so that we can peek at the results. So here we can compare models and we'll compare the first iteration to this next iteration of our fine tuned model. And you'll notice that we don't have as much manual annotation for this newest version, but we can get a sense of how our models performing using our quality model that scales uh, to new data sets. And look at that, our generative AI workflow is making progress in the right direction. Not only is the overall performance improving, but the slice we care the most about, this identity theft slice, has been improved by 55%. A couple of these other slices, verbose and competitors, were slices that we wanted to drive down. These were error modes. We did not want verbose responses or responses that mentioned competitors. So it's actually great to see that we're seeing less data uh, in those slices. So here you can see this fine grain evaluation report that gives you real insight into how your model is performing and how it's improving with each iteration, not just overall, but in the places that you really care about. On that note, it's time to go write your CEO an email and tell him that you improved identity theft questions by 55% and get yourself promoted. I'll wrap up the demo for today. And with that, hand the stage back to Vincent. Thank you for your time. Awesome. Hey, thanks, Rebecca, for the overview of capabilities um, in Snorkel Flow. Just to re recap really briefly, you know, Rebecca showed a number of different uh, modules in Snorkel Flow for um, manual annotation, for how we actually see our customers going through, dropping in their expertise, how you can then have your data science teams collaborate to encode that into labeling functions to train a quality model. And then, of course, how all these pieces come together um, with defined slices to power um, these fine-grained evaluation reports. A few key takeaways here, you know, that I want to leave you with. Three key takeaways, as I mentioned. One, what we found to be empirically the most helpful for teams to really build with confidence is to specialize their evals to their own use cases, right? A lot of the intuitions that Rebecca mentioned, sure, some of them, you know, um, we we uh, can leverage some off-the-shelf signals, right? It is actually a very powerful approach to combine a number of your unique acceptance criteria as labeling functions with a more generic um, LLM as a judge type approach within the quality model. Um, but the key idea is, hey, the more you specialize it to your use case, the more confidence you'll have that the model is doing what you expect. Two, Rebecca showed that a lot of those fine-grained data slices actually help you give a sense you know, for where in your business you need to pay attention. Um, and that ends up being a really powerful way to not just report up you know, to your CEO and get that promotion, but also um, figure out, hey, what do I need to do next? What do I need to improve from a data science, from a SME perspective in order to really, really make sure quality is, is in a great place? And three, you could see that a lot of the artifacts that Rebecca was building, labeling functions for the quality model, slicing functions in the SDK, these were all programmatic. And the benefit of that is once you write it, you can scale. Right? Once you write it, you can audit it. You can come back and say, hey, Rebecca, I actually disagree with that labeling function. Let's talk about it. Right? Let's, let's edit this. Let's version this. Let's collaborate on this. Um, the workflow becomes far more of a software style workflow where you can scale, adapt, and audit these functions over time, much more so than you, know, you might have with an Excel emailing files back and forth, which you know, many of us on the call have had to live with um, or live, live in that reality. So I'll leave you with this. Um, hopefully that's a helpful framing um, for how you can take a lot of these principles to your own LLM evals. Um, and I also want to share uh, one really exciting offer that we have um, that I believe we're announcing first with this webinar. Um, we're going to be, uh, you know, releasing a complementary LLM system valuation um, as of today. So everything you saw here today, uh, we're going to do with you, for you. Um, we're going to be able to, you know, for a select 
subset of customers deliver and walk through a custom eval report. Really try to bring to life these ideas that, hey, the more custom you make your evals, the more fine grain you make your evals, um, the more you can actually come out with some really actionable insights. So for a limited time, you know, we're partnering on the R&D side with our marketing team to, um, you know, uh, generate these free evals for, for uh, you know, these purpose-built evals for a number of our, um, you know, lovely uh, Snorkel community members. And so um, check it out at snorkel.ai slash snorkel-custom-evaluation. So we'll have more of this in the uh, webinar follow-ups, but just wanted to flag this as a very exciting um, way to, you know, just continue to get feedback and bring a lot of these ideas to life over your own uh, data sets. I had a few questions that I flagged to answer live around hey, how, how is LLM as a judge relevant to the quality model? What's the relationship? Um, some people very perceptively pointed out that, hey, is the quality model just an LLM as a judge that's fine-tuned? Short answer is yes, you can certainly think of it that way. One of the benefits um, of the approach we we took with Snorkel is, is a fewfold. One, um, because you're, uh, you know, so I guess let me frame it this way. You could think of a, a, a version of a custom quality model as just the fine tune LM as a judge. With the snorkel approach, you get a few extra benefits, right? One, you're encoding your signals programmatically. So a lot of that rationale, you have a paper trail around, right? You're able to say, hey, Rebecca, you know, marked this as an acceptable response because it was well structured. Well, maybe I agree with that, or maybe I disagree with that, right? Being able to look at those code artifacts and you know, discuss them as a team and collaborate ends up being a really important capability for a lot of our customers. The second benefit um, of, you know, training a custom quality model is that you often get cost and inference savings, right? Rather than deploying and, uh, you know, having to, to deploy, you know, a really expensive LLM with, you know, billions and billions of parameters, the quality model itself is um, much, much more compact and can often help with scalability, speed, um, and and actually just uh, you know manageable inference costs. So a, a lot of these were great questions from a purely academic perspective. Yes, you know you can think of the quality model as a fine-tuned, distilled you know LLM as as a judge. Um, and so the main point of that is yeah you know how do you how do you customize a programmatic model-based approach to use your own custom data and references. Um, some other questions, hey, if you include ground truth in that LM as a judge evaluation, you know, does that help? It, again, you know, a lot of the snorkel approach is to say, hey, you can use that signal and combine that with other sources of signal, including ground truth, including labeling functions, as Rebecca mentioned, and use that as a way to really create a much higher quality set of signals um, um, to, to uh, you know, inform that quality model. A lot of the academic foundations, which I can certainly go into a little bit more detail about probably on another call, we're all about how do you take these different signals, whether it be another LLM, human input, ground truth, and combine them into a high quality you know, model at the end of the day. And that's exactly the approach we're doing here. That's the approach of programmatic labeling is taking these programmatic signals and combining them into high quality outputs, which again, in this case, we're, we're calling a uh, quality model. Um, I had a question as well. Hey, how do you make sure the valuation data is representative of the global population um, of everything you care about? Um, it's a great question. And um, the, the short answer is once you define your data slices, when uh, we have some workflows in the, in the product, you know, um, where, you know, over time you can actually automatically generate and accept or reject these slices. Um, once you define those subsets, you can actually now sample meaningful evaluation data to send to your annotators, right? In a much more budget, um, high ROI uh, way for your budget. So the idea, the idea is, hey, if, if you're having trouble with shipping issues, yeah, maybe we, we focus on, you know, sampling some, some data points from the global, you know, unstructured population of queries to focus on shipping issues. Once you define those slices um, as a representation of what you care about, you can actually leverage that to sample more intelligently, which again, can be the subject of another, um, webinar entirely, but you know that's some intuition that we've used successfully with some of our customers is really, you know, sampling and kind of building evaluation sets based on your slice definitions. At the end of the day, there's a question I don't think you hit on. Someone asked about the time frame. Um, oh yeah, great question. Yeah. What's the time frame for going through these workflow steps in real life? The the really remarkable thing again, it's going to vary per use case, um, but the remarkable thing is that if you're comparing to 
a baseline of frankly, like manual labeling, right? We've worked with some financial services, you know, the customers, some banks um, who have really kind of intelligent and, and uh, you know, knowledgeable analysts who, who, you know, have the knowledge about how their system should work, but having them go through Excel is a multi-month long, you know, possibly kind of person year long process when it, when it gets to the coordination and having all these folks swarm on generating thousands or, or millions of data points. With the historical approach, we've actually seen those exact use cases come down to weeks and honestly, sometimes even days to get your first model out there. The key is that you're able to programmatically scale out that labeling process and using our workflow actually iterate a bit. So you're not focusing on labeling data points that are not high leverage for a use case. You're focusing on labeling and scaling out this process for the critical slices that actually matter. So that combination of scalable programmatic labeling with targeted you know, analysis of where you should be focusing ends up actually accelerating exactly to the order of, you know, days and weeks, which, which is uh, quite exciting for some of those customers. Again, mileage will, will vary depending on the complexity of the use case, but gives a little bit of an order of magnitude of, of what we're seeing. Um, and we do have a lot of great webinars coming up. So just keep an eye out on your inbox. We'll be sending uh, anyone who attended today's event, you'll see future events uh, in your inbox. We have weekly demos. Those are on uh, Wednesdays. Um, so if you want to join a weekly demo, uh, a lot of them are around Gen AI use cases as well as uh, predictive uh, and data labeling use cases. So uh, definitely check those out. And you can find everything on our website at snorkel.ai uh, slash events. So again, everyone, thanks so much for taking an hour out of your day uh, to join us. And we look forward to seeing you at a future webinar or event. Thank you, folks. Really appreciate it. Thank you.